Hello, and thank you for tuning in to McDougal's Medicine with Dr. John and Mary McDougal. I'm their daughter and your host. And tonight, just like every Sunday night, I'm going to get to as many questions as I possibly can. But first, I want to say hi to you, mom and dad, Dr. McDougal and Mary. How are you? Hi. Yeah, it's, we're good. It's been, it's been a good week, to say the least. Good so, to see you. felt good. Had a lot of interesting stuff come out. Uh, oh, you know, I'm just still getting over from. Uh, you know, that, that award that I got, I hate to keep talking about it. I know you guys are tired of hearing about it, but I just, I had so much fun with the people at the plantation conference and got to meet a lot of new people and, you know, some old friends who got oh, together. Old with. friends. Yeah. And what I was really pleased is that the, the people who run the plantation conference saw enough of my lecture that they put it out free to the public. So Heather, you're going to put a link in there and you know, if you would like to see the ceremony, which doesn't last very long, you know, a big deal. You you like get onto the lecture, it, right? It lasts like three minutes. Is that right? Three minutes, yeah. and then and then the lecture I gave is like thirty five minutes, and then there's another hour and twenty minutes of questions, which you might enjoy. Anyway, I I encourage you to watch great. it. It was great. It's the best I've done, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> represents fifty five years of work, and once you see the presentation, you'll say, "Yeah, that probably took him fifty five years." Anyway, that was that was a lot of fun. Uh, so we're back in, in on Earth One <laughs> in the real world. Uh, and, you know, I, I told you I, I read a lot of uh, a lot of stuff. I read you know some newspapers and I read a lot of medical journals and Mary reads novels. You know, she's well entertained. But that's the difference between the two of us. And that's probably one of the reasons we get along so well. But anyway, let me just uh, bring you up to up to speed on three things. And, and I like to start the segment at five o'clock on Sunday evening, five o'clock Pacific time that we do every Sunday. Now, I like to start uh, start with some new things that came to my attention. Either during, either during the past week. In the past week, right. It'll yeah. keep you up to date. And what is today? Today's the 24th, 24th of uh, so. September, 223, 2023. And anyway, I, I, I like to bring you up to date a little bit. And I, you know, hopefully I can get through all three of these. Uh, one of the things has to do with the weight loss problem, so to speak. You know, we have a situation where like 80% of people are overweight or obese. And the phases that people go through, and many of you have been through several of these, is uh, you diet. In other words, you portion control, you, you are hungry, you restrict food, and you suffer in pain. And that doesn't go well. That pain doesn't. It, it has to be painful because, because the hunger drive is there to keep you alive. Okay, so how do you trick the hunger drive? Well, you can do it a low carb diet. You can put yourself into ketosis by restricting carbohydrates. And with ketosis comes the loss of appetite, nausea. You don't eat. You still don't you still don't feel good though. No, you don't have very good bowel movements, you have bad breath, and you have a yeah. high rate of dying of heart disease with a high blood cholesterol. <laughs> and you know, it's not in our idea of how people should live that you know, really care about the world around you. You don't eat all these animals. And anyway, um, so anyway, so here, let me, you're starving. That's one option to deal with a hunger drive or you make yourself uh, nauseated and sick and lose your appetite with a low carb diet. You know, I'm talking about carnivore diet, keto diet. Mary told me don't say Atkins, Atkins. diet anymore. No, he's heard of Atkins. Well, Atkins is something I grew up with. <laughs> anyway, you, you can do that. And uh, now we have a new modern way, a chemical way to make you sick. And yeah, that's so Zempic, Wegovy, and what's the other one? Manjaro. Manjaro. There are three of them out there that make you sick. They, you know, you get nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, which are symptoms similar to what you'd get if you went to the southwest corner of the United States and you got bit by a Gila monster. <laughs> that's right. You get bit by a Gila monster, you throw up, you got diarrhea, you lose your appetite, you nausea. But only lasts. Only lasts. Only lasts a few seconds. <laughs> if you could only prolong a Gila monster bite, you could make drugs out of it that you could sell for like thirteen hundred dollars a month to people. People would pay that well, one thousand two hundred dollars from sure Gila monster can. poisoning. Okay, uh, so if you could prolong the action over a day or half a day or a week, you know, then you could. I mean, after all, <laughs> the public is desperate because they hate the pain. They've given up on the low-carb diets because they're tired of being constipated and worried about dying of heart disease. They're, they're tired of that. 
And now they got a new way, and that's to poison themselves. But, but, and we've talked about this. We talked about how these drugs, they cost you like $1,300 a month. Maybe you can get them cheaper. Probably not. You can get more expensive too. Uh, the weight loss uh, takes place over 68 weeks, which is about well, a little less than one and a half years. And the average weight loss is 37 pounds. That's terrible. Yeah, 37 that, pounds. On a, a year and a half? A year and a half, yeah, that's right. And, and that's $17,000 a year. I think I got the math right on that. 1,300 by 1,400 by 12. You guys can figure it out. Anyway, yeah. And, and, and then I told you, I told you. Like, I mean, I've been telling you this for like four or five or six months. Maybe we should name this sec section. Dr. John McDougall told you so. But I don't sound really egotistical. I'm not going to do that. That's not like me, right? Yeah. Okay. And so, but I told you, I told you four or five months ago when I gave you the lecture on Ozempic, and you can find it on YouTube. But uh, if you look at the hunger, weight loss lecture that I gave on YouTube. And anyway, I talked to you about the plateaus. You know, the weight loss stops at 68 weeks. You lost 37 pounds. You, you, you're $1,700, I think it's $14,000. Uh, you spent, you could have spent it on vacations, lots of other things. You've spent it, it's gone. And you don't lose any more weight. And, and September 18th, 2023, the New York Times had an article about you won't lose weight on Ozempic forever. You know, they're, they're telling you about the, they're telling you uh, September 18th, 2023. New York Times telling you about the plateau. Okay, okay. So you got these options. You can starve, you're in pain. You can do the low carb bit. You can do the Ozempic bit, or you could eat. The hunger drive is not wrong, ladies and gentlemen. You could eat, but the problem is, is you're. We've all learned the wrong kind of food to eat, so we're in big trouble. All right, I, I'm taking more time than I should on this. You're not. You're doing fine. No food. Okay. All right. I've talked to you a lot about breast cancer, and some of you read a book I published in 1980 four or five called McDougall's Medicine, a challenging second opinion. Uh, Heather sometimes gives it away free when she's in a generous mood. And uh, right now I think it's $10. It's on the website. But, uh, you know, I talked about breast cancer then. And I explained to you back then that what I recommend is uh, you get a lumpectomy with clear margins and you take an anti-estrogen approach like the ovaries cut out or tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors. But I recommend it against cutting your lymph nodes out. And we used to, when I first started in this business, and, you know, I spent years in surgery. When I started in this business, we used to take and clear the entire axilla. Oh, uh, I remember that. Yes, <laughs> I remember that. And, and these poor women, they did have swollen arms and pain the rest of their lives. The lymphedema. And then we started just taking a few nodes, sentinel node biopsy, okay. With the idea, it wasn't the idea that we cure anybody. I mean, some doctors thought well, you'd be cured and some patients thought you'd be cured because you thought breast cancer went from the breast to the lymph nodes and then to the rest of the body. This is the Halsteadian theory, which was in the early 1900s, Halstead. You did the surgery, okay? It doesn't happen that way. It goes from the breast through the veins to the rest of the body. That's how it spreads. Okay, so it was never a curative procedure to take these lymph nodes out. It was in a diagnostic procedure. So they used to say, you get to pick the right kind of hormone therapy. It's just an excuse. That's all it was. Anyway, uh, there are a study published in uh, uh, Journal, of, Journal of American Medical Association Oncology. And Heather's <laughs> gonna put the link in there for you. Good grief, Mary. Is powerful. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, this is called sentinel lymph node biopsy versus no axillary surgery in patients. Okay. In, in other words, uh, when they compare doing this uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy, which is just taking a few lymph nodes or one lymph node or two lymph nodes, and you know, they compared that with not doing anything at all. Guess what? <laughs> There's no difference. Everybody knows. So if you don't go through the expense and the pain and the suffering and, you know, there's no difference in anything. Distant metastasis, death, uh, nothing. Anyway, the link is in there if you want to have friends that it's too late for, for most women who are interested in breast cancer. Well, no, you're, you're, you have a one in six or one in seven chance of getting breast cancer if you follow the Western diet. Knock it off. Okay, 
uh, I just dealt with this with one of my friends who has atrial fit. Or no, excuse me, one of my friends who went through uh, angioplasty. I couldn't. I talked him out of it once. I couldn't talk him out of it twice. I tried. He had uh, angioplasty done, and when you have these stints put in the arteries, they're called drug eluding stints. Uh, because there's a high risk of sudden death associated with them from the blood clotting, because the body doesn't like to have metal, foreign substances in it. It just doesn't like it. So uh, what happens is the blood clots and you have sudden death from when, you're on, when you have these, uh, these drug eluding stents. And so because of blood clot forms, we put people on dual antiplatelet therapy, which means aspirin plus, plus Plavix, okay? Dual. I mean, you're right. You're set up to bleed. Let me tell you, and with the idea that's going to reduce the risk of these sudden clots. And you know, we started out telling people you'd be on this for life, and then it was you would be on this for well, I, you know, a lot of doctors still life. Uh, then it was probably twelve months, twelve months, and then articles started coming out that uh, maybe maybe three months is enough to be on dual antiplatelet therapy and then to stop the Plavix. And here you go, folks. Uh, the Journal of American Medical Association Cardiology. This was published also just to right away. It was published. Oh, it was, it was, oh no, it was published online. Let's see. Right here. No, that was the online publication. Was, oh. I think it was, doesn't matter. All right, we have the, we have the citation for you. You can, you can get it out of the chat. <laughs> anyway, we're down to one to two months. It's a big difference. Yeah, from 12 months or life, one to two months. And so you need to know this and you need to talk to your doctor about if you've had a stint. You know, you've served your time. What happens is these drug eluting stints, what they mean by that drug eluting is they put um, cancer-like drugs in the stint that stops the cells from proliferating so that the, uh, the smooth muscle cells don't completely close down the graph what they do. 40% of the time with a bare metal stint by the end of a year. So they put these cancer drugs in there, like cancer drugs that stop the proliferation. But then you're leaving the uh, bare metal. And, uh, you know, the idea being you prevent the clot with dual antiplatelet therapy. In other words, it really thins your blood. So you're less likely to get a clot. Well, all right, maybe that made some sense. Maybe it didn't with a bare metal stint. You know, not a drug eluding, but a bare metal, which we used to put in. That's we, what I was going to say. We, we did. We never gave a dual antiplatelet therapy. Yeah, because they used to just put in plain metal ones. They did. And they, then yeah. they put in these drug ones. So why did they have to add drugs to them if they already have drugs? Well, well, well uh, we should go through the whole history of this. Yeah. What you do, it started in 1978. Uh, you take a catheter, you put it up in the coronary artery. And you've got hard, fibrous, non-lethal scars sitting there, which the doctor can't resist doing something about. <laughs> Sometimes they cause chest pain, but they're non-lethal. They don't kill. And that's why all the studies, all the studies on angioplasty, they show no survival benefit. No matter how sick the patient was, no matter how extensively you do the angioplasty. No, I can show you all the studies, non-zero period. Anyway, anyway, so uh, they, they rupture these non-lethal plaques and what happens because they release products of injury, okay? Because you rupture the plaque, you break that little guy up, you know? <laughs> so you release these products of injury which cause the blood to clot. All right, so what, ha what they found out is half the arteries treated are completely closed down with blood clots within five months. Not a good idea. So what they did next is they decided they were going to put in metal stents. They're like a Chinese finger puzzle. You put in these stents, which uh, did keep the, the arteries open and, and less risk of a clot forming. But as I told you, I started to tell you, the body doesn't like bare metal in it. So the smooth cells proliferate. And within a year, 40% of the arteries so treated are completely closed. So to stop the proliferation, they put in these cancer-like drugs. That's the drug Aluti. Well, it all eludes, all the drugs gone in one to two months. That's what this article says. So now you, you're you like treated with like a bare metal, which they don't give drug, drug antiplatelet therapy to. So in other words, I'm telling my patients, the ones that I'm caring for, 
that's time to get off the dual antiplatelet therapy if you meet this type of criteria. I'm telling the rest of you, get the article and go talk to your doctor. Why, sh why should you be at risk of bleeding to death? And there's so no advantage. Doesn't make sense to me. Minimize the drugs, not, you know, less is more. But you would never recommend that anybody would just quit. You want them to talk to their doctor first mm -hmm. and, and decide with their doctor how oh, they want to deal with it. And you know what? This, this lady or gentleman is working for you. You, you, the, you know, you're the customer. They're working for you. So you go in and you ask them some questions. Now, don't let them get defensive. You know, don't let them say things like, like, who went to medical school, you or me? Who's the doctor here? Don't you dare ask me questions. You need to get out of that office real quick. All right, so you should go and talk to your doctors. And if it's, it's the kind of doctor you want, they're going to discuss this with you. And, you know, the doctor might say, you know, us in the doctor business got a lot of ego trouble, but we might say, thank you very much. You, you helped me practice medicine better than I would have before we talked on this topic. That's what you should hear. But I tell you, you're dealing with a really tough business. Maybe now that we have more women in the business, there'll be better communication between you. Don't you think so? Could be. These, these men, I'll tell you. <laughs> Heather, how about some questions? <laughs> Lots of questions coming in. Thank you for bringing all that up. I put those articles in the chat and you can find them on your own on Google, right? Well, okay, you lots of questions. Oh, they're actually, I think they're free. I think they're both open access. If they're not, you'll get enough of the abstract to get the idea. And the doctor has access through his or her medical library. So, you know, forewarn the doctor, send the doctor an email, say, I want to discuss this article. Will you please pull it up. Doesn't cost him anything, a couple of minutes. And you know what? It'd be fair to pay the doctor too. If you want to sit down, remember the average office visit is seven minutes. Seven minutes. Barely have time to hand you a prescription and to tell you goodbye. See you and tell you not just goodbye, but see you in another two months for a seven minute visit. Um, anyway, if you're going to take the doctor's time to read the article, to discuss this with you, pay for it. You know, it's fair. You know, tell them, look, I'll pay you whatever you make, 100 bucks, 200 bucks, probably more like 300 bucks an hour. <laughs> I'll pay you because it's my life. You know, you're talking about whether I die or live. You know, whether I'm handicapped from excessive axillary node surgery or whether I end up on a drug that bankrupts me and gives me a plateau. <laughs> oh, <laughs> zip peak. Hey, you know, I got that jingle in my head. Oh, I no. can't get it out of my head, the Ozempic, this overweight, but she's lovely, woman who dances around selling Ozempic as a diabetic drug, right? Oh, no, I'm, uh, that's the one, that's Jardines. That's oh, the one that I, I think. No, I think there are head. two. I think I got the Ozempic one in my head. You oh, yeah. have the Jardines. Oh, man, these people head. are really good. They don't talk to you about, what they do is they, and you listen to what they say. They say nothing about, anything really meaningful they kind of skirt all the issues and dance around tell you how wonderful your life is going to be if you'll just be yeah. on their drugs and say. then they give you 90 seconds worth of and this may kill you and you'll get cancer <laughs> and you know you drop dead of whatever <laughs> i don't i can't but i can't believe it and you know what the only thing i would ask is give them an option you know tell them about the work we do and other people who believe in starch-based diets, plant food-based diets. You know, lots of folks out there, whole plantation group I saw a couple of weeks ago. American, American College of Lifestyle Medicine has got 5,000 members. We'll be at that one too. I'm not talking at that one, but we'll be at that one too. You know, so there are lots of people out there that, that will listen to you and take the time and work with you. That's what you want. You're the customer. Thank you. Okay, you ready for some questions? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. Coming in. Okay, this is from Jolie. She's 57, menopausal, tired all the time. How do you feel about women taking hormone replacement therapy? Well, there's a whole chapter in a book called The McDougall Program for Women. It's chapter 13. It's called Hormone Replacement Therapy. And I, I wrote it a while back, but there's nothing outdated in it. 
And it talks to you about the hormone replacement therapy, which I've prescribed to women my whole career and still plan on doing. But I do it, I think, in a safer way. And it discusses that in the book, The McDougall Program for Women. I'm not here to sell books, okay? You can probably get it for 25 cents in the used bookstore or free in the library. It should still be in the libraries. Uh, anyway, it tells you. And then what, what I put in there in, on one of the pages, uh, a whole prescription on how I recommend these drugs be dispensed. I don't recommend you take them as pills. Uh, I recommend you take them as skin creams. Uh, I recommend you take estradiol, which is the hormone that you used to make. Okay, uh, there's a, what, what's the horse hormone? Premarin. Premarin, yeah. Pre pregnant mare's urine. <laughs> that's, that's a profile that has seven estrogens in it. Five are unique to horses. So you don't want to take the Premarin form. You want to take the estradiol form of estrogen. And they still prescribe that, don't they? I think so. That's not I've looked up recently, Mary. But, oh, okay. And uh, anyway, you do that. And then uh, I, I put a little progesterone in. Uh, I, I think it's 0.5 milligrams of estradiol. You can look it up. And uh, 20 milligrams of progesterone. And and I put these two together. And you just use it as skin, skin cream. You use it every day. And you use it just to treat symptoms. If you don't have symptoms, don't do it. You know, hot flashes, uh, poor feelings of well-being. Uh, don't do it. And the other reason you might consider these uh, these topical uh, preparations is if you decide uh, you need a little help in the vagina area, or you feel like you want to fool, fool Mother Nature, and that is you want to have sex after menopause. See, Mother Nature says, once you can't have babies, there's no reason to have sex. I'm not going to go any further in this discussion, Heather. Heather, it's done. I'm over. <laughs> Okay, but Thank you know you. sometimes you want to fool Mother Nature, and the vagina gets very thin. So there's estradiol cream that you insert in the in the vaginal cavity, and again, very very benign therapy that gives you a lot of benefit. Uh, once in a while, I have a woman who, or usually her husband, uh, says, uh, "How about throwing a little testosterone into this concoction, Doc?" You know what they're thinking, right? Okay, I haven't found it very helpful. You know, I haven't found the married couple coming back and say, whoa, just like when I was 22. <laughs> they don't do that. But the problem I've noticed is that when you take the testosterone as a woman, you start smelling like a man. It's not, not conducive. Not to, attractive. No, not to most. Well, some <laughs> men it would be, but not to most men. Okay. Let's get on, not get into that. It's just an odor that you get from the male hormone. So, and I really haven't noticed an increase in libido, is what we would say in a nice way. Thank you. Can I answer the whole question? Let's see. I think I, so. I, the, reason I, oh, the reason I don't get pills is because first, pa first pass kinetics. Okay, you really want to know about this. When you take a pill, what happens is the pill goes through the gut into the venous blood system, and then it goes to the liver. Okay, in the liver, it gets all crunched around. All the estrogen gets messed up and different kinds of estrogen are made and broken apart. And, and then it goes out into the rest of the system. Okay, so going through the liver first means first pass kinetics, right? And then if you put it on the skin, it goes to the breasts and the ovaries and the uterus first before it goes to the liver and gets all crunched up. So that's why I put it on the skin. You don't take it as pills. That's what I do. And it's in the book called The McDougall Program for Women, which is probably $10 on the website. Or like I say, you probably get it for 25 cents in a used bookstore. <laughs> it's a good book. I'll yeah. tell you, I don't have to change anything. Yeah, you know, I, all I have to do is add stuff to it. You know, like, like I told you, I wrote, I wrote this in McDougall's Medicine, A Challenging Second Opinion. I wrote this in 1984. Here, this is this is the one about the the nodes, you know, the lymph nodes in the axilla. You know, the truth hasn't changed since then, ladies and gentlemen. And there's not a lot of money going to anything but selling your products. It's business. <laughs> Wake up. Thank you. <laughs> okay, next uh, question. This is from Jim. He says his doctor wants him to have a stool test for colon cancer every year. 
He's wondering if it's really necessary. He's 70 years old and eats a starch-based diet. Well, he's, he gave me a lot of reasons I'd say it's not necessary. Uh, one is he's 70. At 75, the standard recommendation is to stop testing. So he's almost there. The other thing is he eats the diet that prevents colon cancer and polyps. I assume it's a starch-based diet, not just a plain old vegetarian diet. Starch-based diet with lots of rice and potatoes and corn and so on. Uh, so no, the standard recommendation is you should have a test, a stool test, between the ages of, say, 60 and 75 years old. The options, and this is the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force that says this, the options are you can test the stool for blood. There's a genetic test for blood, an uh, immunologic test for blood, and there's a, just another fecal blood test. You can uh, test it for genetic material that's shed by polyps that are abnormal and, and, and colon cancers, and that's called a cologuard. Now, the first test, the blood test, it costs between three and forty dollars. You haven't done every year for two or three years. That's it. You would never recommend someone will keep doing them once no, a year for years. No, I can't see any reason. You, you've had adequate screening. If you've gone through one of these therapies, you only do it once, unless there's something wrong. Then, then the doctor will tell you to do it twice or more. But you need to understand there's no evidence. Uh, excuse me. There's there's evidence that sigmoid exams will reduce your risk of dying of colon cancer. I don't know that I have time to get into all that, but the only randomized controlled trial that's ever been done was published in October 27th, the year 2022. In the New England Journal of Medicine, it was a study of 58,000 people in Poland and Norway and other parts of Europe where they had them get a colonoscopy. And compared it, it was the first and only randomized control trial, only. And what they found after 10 years was there's no, no survival advantage to those who got the colonoscopy. It didn't work. Complete failure. But of course, the spin doctors got out there and lied to you in the public <laughs> press. But the study is clear. And the people who interpret it honestly to interpret it just what it says. It doesn't work. Now, the reason it doesn't work is because uh, this is a dangerous test, all right? Seven, seven, seven tenths of a percent of people have a major complication, bleeding, perforation of the colon, seven tenths percent. You know, like, so that's one in a hundred. But if that one in a hundred, you're in big trouble. That's the problem is that for every life saved for the colonoscopy, you end up killing one person through the surgery, through the anesthesia, through pre and post-op recommendations, or the surgeries that follow. You know, if you find something, then you get real serious about dangerous things. So that's why there's no survival benefit, no reduction in overall mortality, we call it, or overall survival benefit. There's none, zero, doesn't work. Do you think that your colonoscopy doctors are going to tell you this? No, they have at risk somewhere around $3,000, the hospital and ward and so on, about 3,000 bucks an exam. That's what's up for, that's what's up on the table. Colgar, I think I told you $600. What was the question? What was the question? Well, whether he should be, uh, Jim should be getting oh, yeah, yeah. Whole, whole Again, I gave you every long year. answer. <laughs> Let's go <Okay>. on. <laughs> the answer is okay. if you were, I would give you the standard recommendations, and that is you do two or three fecal blood tests, one annual uh, every year for two or three years. Okay, that's. I like to give short answers. You like to explain why you're telling people all these things. Unless they tune in every Sunday at five o'clock Pacific time. Yeah, then they hear. Them. Then they hear it over and over and over again. Okay. And then the, then they'll be. I don't know. I, I think you'll be a better consumer. At least you'll know another point of view. The name of the book that I published, the second national best-selling best book I published in 1985 was McDougall's Medicine, A Challenging Second Opinion. The uh, lectures that I just gave, five of them, which we have for sale, McDougall's Medicine, A Challenging Second Opinion. All I did is I took, well, not all I did. <laughs> I, I, I took that book and I reviewed the literature and brought you up to date on weight problems, on diabetes, on cancer, 
on heart disease, and on general nutrition, like where do you get your protein? Where do you get your calcium? So there's 10 hours of lecture. That's what McDougall's Medicine of Challenging Second Opinion has turned into. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Next question, Heather. <laughs> Well, this is a good question that goes along uh, with uh, what we were talking about. And so, and I hear this a lot. And yeah. so Gabby wrote in and she says, but my husband has had polyps removed. He's 46. How can yeah. that not help save him? Well, I think it does. As I said, sigmoidoscopy, Z, you're taking out a precancerous lesion. Sigmoidoscopy is one of the tests. I just didn't complete that sentence. Well, I sort of did. I told you sigmoidoscopy reduced uh, risk of dying. You see, with sigmoidoscopy, and what I did is I got into the colonoscopy bit where you kill a certain number of people, you know, that counterbalance is the one you save. Usually people have colonoscopy, so it's hard to find a place that will do just yeah. the sigmoidoscopy. Yeah. yeah. See, with the sigmoid, there's no risk. It, there's no pain. There's no sedation. So that's why you end up with a total reduction in mortality. So having the polyps removed, but it's precancerous. These are not cancers. These are polyps. But yeah. if you find them, you should have them Remo removed yeah. again. Um, if you okay. if you found some, then you have you would naturally have it done again. Well, that's what you recommended. But see, the problem is, Mary, we don't know. If, the reason we don't know, I just told you, the only first randomized controlled trial ever done. Yeah. So, you know, we have no trials that tell us whether or not once somebody's had polyps, by the, by the way, up to 42% of the time, polyps are missed by the colonoscopist. So you don't necessarily have a clean colon when they're done. Okay. So uh, and anyway, the, the nobody's, nobody, they just, just did the first study on screening they haven't even addressed whether or not you well, how often you should get repeat tests once you've had polyps nobody knows but i can tell you one thing i do know that they don't know and they should know <laughs> <laughs> is that polyps regress when you change your diet yeah colon cancers i you know i believe colon cancer once you even have the colon cancer it's benefited by changing your diet and you know what the American Cancer Society agrees with me. It's not the standard practice of medicine, I know. Why do you think we offer a challenging second opinion? Every Sunday, five o'clock Pacific time. Bring your <laughs> friends, bring your friends and relatives. Come on, guys. We need to spread the good news. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Next question. What do you think about the Watchman procedure for AFib, which gets someone off blood thinners? This is yeah, I, I don't know enough about it to give an opinion, Heather. This, this is, I, I believe, a type of double ablation or something. That's. Uh, I mean, look it up. No, well, you can look it up. So, but it is, it's an ablation procedure where you don't have to take the anticoagulants, which is, you know, good. Uh, but I, I wouldn't comment any further on that because I just plain and simple have not looked into it, studied or had any patients who went through it. But I, you know what? I got a feeling it's probably a good procedure. Uh, yeah. Certainly yeah. something I would get, I would myself look into if I had atrial fib. But as long as you brought up atrial fib. Well, look up. This is what they do. Uh no, they take the they take a little bit of oh they take a little bit of the atrium out. Yeah, I remember that. Okay, places the device. Oh yeah, that's in the right. left atrial appendage right, and removes that. the catheter, closes the insertion site. Yeah, got it. Anyway, okay. she knows more about it than I do. <laughs> so um, uh, anyway, there are probably some reviews out there. I certainly get a few second opinions as far as atrial fib. It's caused by the Western diet. It's closing up the small blood vessels, and as a result, you get problems with the electrical system. You need to know a couple of things. One, it doesn't have to be treated, okay? Uh, the reasons you treat are to slow the heart rate down if the heart rate is, say, above 110 beats per minute. Then you give uh, digoxin or a little bit of enderol to slow the heart rate down so the heart is more efficient. But when you lose the atrium function, which you do in atrial fibrillation, you've reduced your cardiac function by about 25% which unless you climb mountains, it ain't no big deal. You'll get along just fine. And uh, then the other drug therapy that you have to consider is whether or not you take blood thinners. And of course, the Watchman procedure is another one. Ablation is another one. 
So there are a couple other things to look into. Uh, and, and whether or not you should take these drugs, this is totally independent of, uh, of ablation or the Watchman procedure. We're talking about people who are, you know, standard medical practice, all right? Whether or not you need the drugs depends on what kind of health you're in. If you're in good health, you shouldn't be taking the drugs because the harm from Coumadin and Eliquis, et cetera, always the benefit if you're in good shape. And how do you find out if you're in good shape and you meet this al al algorithm? Oh, I know that one. Tell them. Chad's. How do you spell it? C-H-A-D-S. All right. <laughs> See, the show does get across to some people. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, Chad, it's Chad's score. Just go on uh, Wikipedia or uh, and read by. And most of our patients are healthy, so they don't need to take the blood thinners. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Is atrial fib more common now than it used to be? It seems yeah. like I hear a lot more about it than I, I ever do, I used do, too. To. I'd have to look it up, but I do, too. I, but, of course, people are sicker than they used to be. That's true. Except they're having less heart disease than they did in the 50s. I don't know. I'll have to, I'll have to look into that. But in the 50s, where we had the highest rate of heart disease uh, for American males. And we got better because of the five-country study, the dietary goals, of the United States, you know, the McGovern report, there was a lot of interest in, uh, you know, we did some things that weren't necessarily for good health, like replacing uh, animal fat with vegetable fat. And people ended up just as fat, in fact, fatter, but they had less risk of, of dying of heart disease with vegetable fat, but they had uh, as much diabetes and probably as much cancer, uh, particularly when they take in the omega-6 fats like corn oil. So uh, if you take in the omega-3 fats, uh, you have an increased risk of bleeding. So don't do that. You know, anyway, eat a, eat a good diet. That's what I recommend. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is actually for you, mom. John mm -hmm. wants to know, how do you feel about accepting a processed product that has Oreo listed as the very last ingredient? Um, I have been known to use those things myself, so I can't say never touch them. Um, I would definitely look for a, a better option because there are more and more places that are making things without oils. These days I've found many things in the supermarket that will say right on the package, no oil added. And um, so those kind of things I look for. Um, it depends a lot on what it is. If it were uh, like a salad dressing and oil was the last ingredient, there would be an awful lot of other ingredients in there because it would still be mostly oil. Now, if it were bread and it were the very last ingredient, then it would probably be something that I would think, well, that's pretty good because I'm getting a lot of whole grains. and. Um, I would rather not have the oil, but if I can't find one without it, then I'll I'll buy one that has oil at the last of the list. And you probably don't approve of that, right? Uh -huh. well, thank you. <laughs> no, no, listen, no, it's it, from practical terms. What Mary says is absolutely correct, and we do have some products, very few though, uh, that list oil as the last ingredient. But it's a it's a principle of education. Okay, I I, I have I can teach you in in uh, green and red, uh, white and black, I, yes and no. You don't yeah. learn maybe, or or I'll cut down, or, or moderation. Moderation kills. So as far as an education, we tell you, just leave it alone. Oh, well, it was, oh, it, it was the last, oh, no, now it's the fourth to the last ingredient. Oh, oh, oh you know, it's a slippery yes. slope. Yes, yes. This that's, is what, that's what we, so true. We teach the way we do is, so that you have a good chance and really understand what we really want you to do. But hey, the human body's tough. You, the human body is really tough. I've told you this many times and I don't <laughs> mind admitting it again, one more time. The human body puts up with two packs of cigarettes a day, a third of a bottle of whiskey a day, and hot dogs wrapped in <laughs> bacon daily. <laughs> I tested it. <laughs> I don't do that anymore. No way. No. But, but uh, to, to put, to, to, I look back and I think I cannot believe how much my body put up with. Oh, 
I'm serious. <laughs> think about them, what you did to your body. But the, but the body never stops healing. Oh, you just give it a chance. And the best chance you have is the principles we teach, and we teach them in a way that we think it's most likely for you to succeed, and that is yes and no. <laughs> we don't go maybe or moderation. It's educational. Practicality, if you do 95% of the program, you're likely to get 95% of the results, but not always. There's sometimes just micro ingredients are troublesome, like autoimmune diseases. You know, just a tiny bit of yeah. dairy protein will tear those joints up. So, you know, maybe a little oil you get away with. Well, how much? How much? Well, that's the problem. You see, you find, well, it's got a little bit of oil. It's the last ingredient, but up here, a few more ingredients higher. It says um, something else that maybe I shouldn't, I can't yeah, pronounce like it. Like cellulose so, or something. Yeah, or something. That I, I probably Agar, agar, agar. Or and I don't know what it is, but, and so it, it does build up until you get. So what I say, it says monotriglycerides <laughs> and uh, diglycerides. diglycerides. Yeah, this is a good trick. They use this oh, in the yeah. industry, yeah. <laughs> You know, they, they what they do is uh, triglycerides are fat. This is uh, three carbon chains attached to a glycerol backbone, for those of you who remember your chemistry. Okay, three fatty acid chains to attach to a glycerol backbone. That's that's a triglyceride. There are diglycerides, which is just two chains of fat attached to the glycerol backbone. And there are monoglycerides, one chain. They're all fats, but they don't have to list them as fat. They can list them as monoglycerides and diglycerides. They list them as monoglycerides. And you go, what in the heck? Is that? What is that monoglyceride stuff? A glyceride stuff? No, it's not triglycerides. I'll eat it. It's just, they just, just, they just change it. Thank you, Mary. This just change the fat. I haven't listened. That's a new one, Heather. I haven't told you that one before. <laughs> I'm telling you, I learn something new every show. I love it. Yeah, all right. Well, okay. I'll, probably, I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep doing the show as long as I uh, find something new to teach. You. So when people stop coming and they stop asking questions, then we'll All quit. right. But then we can quit. I don't want to. You'll have fun. I love yeah. it. Okay. Next question. This is from Karen. She wants to know how many dark leafy greens she needs to eat every day. Three. <laughs> 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 I mean, is that three, 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 three stalks of, of asparagus or three? Bro it's not very much. Okay. You know, I, I put down an arbitrary, I just guessed, that's all, uh, that, you know, 10% of your calories should come from fruits and vegetables. Well, they, and they make such a big deal about um, kale oh, and geez. chard and all these deep, dark, green, leafy vegetables that you should be eating. So your whole plate is filled with all these greens. That would, that would, be, that would keep me away from being a vegetarian. Yeah, if you had to eat all that. If I had to live on lettuce <laughs> or kale or kale or even broccoli or asparagus, can you imagine if somebody was trying to sell that kind of diet to you? Could you eat it? If that's or, all or, you got to eat, that'd be yeah. awful. Or, or three quarters of your diet was that. Yeah. You got a little potato. Little, oh, he'd be a little potato or a little rice. No, people are star cheaters. You got to please give in. That you, you are starchy. You're supposed to eat beans, corn, okay, potatoes, sweet potatoes, rice, wheat, breads, pastas. This, this is your food. So you do mostly that. How much? I say 90%. She says 70%. It's because we calculate differently. Just make sure starch is really dominant on your plate, okay? And... Uh, you know, just you, you love starches. You love potatoes. There's a reason you love potatoes. It tastes good. The reason you love pasta. <laughs> the reason you love bread. Yeah, they taste. You have starch tasting taste buds on the tip of your tongue. Okay, the the school that Heather's son starts soon <laughs> actually discovered these taste buds on the tip of the tongue. It's their starch tasting tasting taste buds. They were discovered ten years ago. We don't have just we don't just have sweet and salt on the tip of the tongue, you know that we seek we seek sweetness and salt, you know that, and and bitter and sour, which are on the back of the tongue, which causes us to not eat things. You something bitter or sour, you spit it out. It's poison. So Oregon State University yeah. developed the starch um, taste buds. Yeah, starch they, taste buds. What they did is they uh, 
is they numbed the sweet, tasty taste buds with a chemical. And then they presented these people with various starches and they had a tremendous response. And the people they were just it. as, yeah, they were just as strong as the sugar oh, starch. Okay. Yeah. okay. So anyway, that reference is uh, on the slide where I talk to you about your taste buds. <laughs> and you've seen that. You've seen the picture of the tongue. It's in it, many yes. of the lectures I've given with a little cat. You know, I get this little cat up in the corner and I explain to you about your tongue, you know, the sweet and the salty and the starchy and the, you know, I talk about your whole tongue and how it's designed. Then I tell you about a cat's tongue. There are no sweet tasting taste buds on a cat's tongue. Uh, there are no starch taste buds on a cat's tongue. A cat has taste buds for amino acids, proteins. That's because the cat is a carnivore. You have no taste buds for protein or amino acids. You don't like that. I know you don't like that <laughs> because when you eat something that's high protein, you put steak sauce all over it. <laughs> you put barbecue sauce, you cook it to death. It's already dead. Put salt <laughs> all over it. <laughs> Stop doing that. It doesn't taste good. It's disgusting. Thank you. Okay, next question. Um, this is from Justin, I think. Why not eat a diet high in simple carbs since the body breaks down complex carbs into simple carbs anyway? Yeah, well, you know, it, it, it's because of the way the body was designed. You know, it's been through what? You know, four, four million years of humanoid evolution. You know, mammalian evolution goes back, I don't know, many hundreds of millions of years, long time. It, the body was never confronted with refined starches or simple sugars to any extent, except for maybe some honey, maple syrup. It just, that it, it, was, it was not designed to eat that kind of food. When you eat simple sugars, they rapidly go through the gut wall into the bloodstream and cause a rise, a bit of a rise in blood sugar, but a rapid rise in insulin. And high insulin levels are associated with more cancer, more heart disease, and so on. Why? Because same common denominator is the food. Anyway, it's a long, long story. But, uh, you know, you don't have the fiber. Uh, the other thing, you mentioned simple sugars, refined flours. How much refining? You know, a lot of these are refined to the point where they're deficient in other nutrients, protein, vitamins, minerals, fats. Uh, they're empty calories. They call them empty calories. So that's not so good. Uh, a lot, you know, and you just you need that fiber from the start. Well, you, you also need vitamins that are like, yeah. for example, in the coat of rice. Rice has a coat, but uh, has thiamine in it, B1. And if you don't eat it, it's berry berry again. Boy, you get really sick and die on that guy. So, you know, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, there are probably a hundred different things I didn't mention. But, but you have a point. And that is a, a simple diet may accelerate the body's ability to heal. And I would look at uh, two things to say that. One is Walter Kempner's work. Remember Walter Kempner, tremendous healing, a diet of white rice, fruit, fruit juice, and simple sugar. And part of his understanding was this is sets the body up best for metabolic processes that heal. So, you know, maybe what the question was has some real relevance to it. The other thing is, is uh, I would uh, refer to my friends at uh, at True North. I mean, there's the ultimate in a uh, low nutrient, <laughs> <laughs> empty calorie diet. It's called water. And they, they fast. And the idea of these, these fasting folks is that, again, I don't know. It's not my field. The idea is, is the body heals better without being confronted with food. So, you know, I, I think you have a point of view, but I don't think you should have it as a lifetime diet. Uh, I think you need it uh, maybe for some healing processes, like, you know, if you want to have a water fast for a week or longer, or go to True North. They'll take good care of you. <laughs> that's in Santa Rosa, California. Uh, look at the Kempner diet. You know, that's a very safe, very effective diet. But And it's very simple and a lot of simple sugars. And, and I have to do that. I put people who have lost like 90% of their heart. Or ninety percent of their kidneys. I have to, you know, they're just they're staying alive, you know, on a string, and they have to eat that kind of diet. But not you that have a hundred percent kidney function, a hundred percent heart function. You shouldn't be eating that way. There's no reason for that kind of restriction. 
thought. You know, you take care of some of the people I take care of. And yeah, you have to get really tight to give them some more years or weeks or months or whatever they get. People, people get real sick from the food. In fact, half, half die you. of heart disease. <laughs> strokes okay next question this is from cheryl she's lost a bunch of weight eating starches but have it has increased her hip pain despite being uh, less weight is it possible it's still due to inflammation or osteoarthritis yeah any suggestions uh, probably osteoarthritis you know because she was overweight and that put lots of, i know that because she says she's lost weight and that's put a lot of a lot of extra wear and tear on her hip joints so if she's getting older too and these things kind of show up and they show up, uh, you know, at inopportune times. Who knows? I mean, you've been through it all, haven't you? A little arthritis in the shoulder that goes away and then you got it in the neck and <laughs> you know, got pain in your back. <laughs> you know what I mean? And most of these things, they go away OK, you know, the result of an injury that you didn't recognize or maybe some extra wear and tear on your joints from exercising. That may be part of your program, too, is increasing your exercise. That would be tough on your hips. Uh, what I would do is I would listen to my hip. If it hurts, don't do it. Okay. <laughs> and, and that's a good, a good thing to, uh, to consider in all exercises is this is not supposed to be painful. And so if you're getting a feedback of, look, this hurts, it's, then it hurts. Because you're not getting a confusing message. It hurts. The damage is being done. Don't do it. So pick up some other kind of exercise, maybe uh, swimming or maybe rowing or maybe bicycling would work out well for you. And of course, then at the end of the line, I'll just mention that before we go on to the next question. There's always total hip replacement, which is a good operation, you know, but it's a tough one. It's, it's, good, it's a big deal. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is from Jennifer. She's from Calgary. She has a 98 year old dad, 95 year old dad, who wants to do some cross country skiing this winter. He's on no meds and just has a little arthritis in his thumb. Do you think this will be okay? Oh, I can't even comment. I'm, that's just, that's beyond, that's beyond any imagination. I think she's, she's just teasing us, Mary, you know, to think that, you know, we could possibly get that old and still want to scream. Yeah, I really. Yeah. I, 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 uh, I don't think so. I think she's telling the truth. She wants to know if her dad can do it. Hey, look. You, you don't want to ever look back and say, I wish I would have done that. As long as you think there's a good chance you'll survive it. So, I mean, that's the way I've always lived. Good answer. Yeah. I like that. I'm talking about windsurfing just today. I was talking about windsurfing just today. And, and when I was talking about it, I was out back on that board going 34 miles an hour across the, across the ocean in, and mind. in my mind. <laughs> but, but you never know. You, you never know. know. I'm only 76 years old. You might. You might. Well, I, my, my son tells me there are people in their 80s that are out there windsurfing. So you never right. know. Okay, next question. I know you don't really like answering this question, but it's come up right. a couple of times. This is from Roz, and she wants to know what you think about the latest COVID vaccine or booster or whatever oh. it's called. Well, I, you know, I, 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 I keep pretty close track on this for family reasons, okay? This is not professional advice. I'm not an expert on vaccines. I'll just tell you what I've observed in the, in the actions that I've taken in our family. This is Mary and I and the kids and the grandkids is I believe in vaccinations. I really do, except for two. And those are the flu vaccine and the COVID vaccines. Uh, COVID has worked really hard trying to convince me that it doesn't work. But every time I pick up the newspaper, I find out there's a new vaccine and a new variant. That's the same as with the flu. They can't catch this virus. You know, with the flu vaccine, what they do is they, they make a, a, a vaccine against viruses that occurred three years ago or five years ago or two years ago, last year's vaccine or virus. And, and then the, the, the same old virus doesn't seem to come through. And that's what they're doing is they're chasing around this COVID-19. But that said, viruses that don't have the propensity to shift their genetics, you know, variables, variants, viruses that don't do that. You know, my family has received vaccinations. Uh, they've received, you know, DPTs and polio and hepatitis and 
you know, Mary and I just recently got a uh, shingles. shingles vaccine and a pneumococcal vaccine. Yeah. Don't throw the baby out with the wash water, you know. And as far as, you know, keep your mind open. Maybe someday they'll invent a, a stable vaccine or the virus will be stable enough or they'll figure out, you know, some some way that it doesn't keep shifting and there'll be effective uh, COVID vaccines. These are smart people. They put a lot of money into this. I, I think for the first time in my uh, my life, I've realized, I guess I haven't thought about it, that, that vaccinations are a huge business. <laughs> I mean, I used to be the, be aware of the business idea when I go to the grocery store and they told me I got 10% off my groceries, 10% off my groceries if I got a vaccine, a flu vaccine. I said, there's got to be business here. And now I see, you know, I don't know, every hour, two or three ads for one vaccine or the next. It's big business. You know, it used to be polio, socks, Sabin. You, know, you knew they were scientists. They just did it to help humanity. Not so sure these days, are you? Thank you for that. Okay, this question is from Billy. He wants to know what advice you would give to someone who's been advised that they need triple bypass surgery and that angioplasty is not an option. Well, <laughs> I'd send him to the 12 day program pronto. So they could get a second opinion. Uh, this is not a one one word or one sentence answer. Uh, I would go to uh, right now. I'd go to YouTube when you're, we're done here, and I look up McDougal and heart disease and see my lecture they gave on heart disease. It talks to you about the studies on uh, on angioplasty, the ones I talked to you about the first of this hour. It talks to you about the studies on bypass surgery. There have been three major studies on bypass. There was just one recent done that I want to tell you about too. There's been three major studies on uh, a bypass. So the, the veterans, the European, and the CAS study. They were all published around 1985. There haven't been any studies done since then, except for one. These three major studies show virtually no, no, no discernible significant benefit from doing heart surgery as opposed to not doing it. Randomized trials. There was just a, public, a study published. Uh, I, I can't pull it up now, but I could in three, 30 minutes, 30 seconds. <laughs> just a study published which found no survival benefit five years after open heart surgery. We're not talking about angioplasty, we're talking about open heart bypass surgery. No survival benefit of five years, they had to wait till 10 years. And the people that they treated were really sick people. Oh, maybe you would fall in that category. Maybe you'd say, I could wait to see the, the statistics play out in my favor. And maybe you'd look at the statistics and find out it's such a tiny bit of percentage. Even at 10 years, there's, there's no significant benefit of five. You know, if you were well informed, maybe you could make a better decision. You also need to read the part about the side effects, like the brain damage that occurs in essentially everybody who goes on the heart lung machine, which they usually use for heart surgery. I mean, if you have to go through heart surgery, you go through off pump or beating heart surgery, which is where they don't attach you to the pump. Anyway, you got a lot. Of, you got a lot of decisions to make. They're really tough, and of course, that's what we do in the twelve day programs. We help you with these decisions. But you can do it for free. I, I, everything I've told you, well, it's not everything. I didn't, I don't, I, that new study is, is actually, the new study's in the five day, five, the, the five lecture series that we have, Heather's selling. It's uh, the one on heart disease. So the, the new study's in there, but all the oldest studies I was telling you about are all, all cited in the free lecture on YouTube. Yeah. I don't know. I like the new lecture. I think I did a really good job. <laughs> you I did a great this, job. I'm getting to the point in my life where uh, I'm, I'm probably not going to discover very many new things, but I'm going to certainly work to, to make the old things that I have discovered to be more relevant and helpful. And that's what I try and do. I, you know, I just I just don't see a lot of horizons out there. You will you will find new things because you will be reading all of this yeah. stuff, and it'll all be lies. Well, not, not a lot of it is well, only seventy percent is only okay. seventy percent is based on industry. That's what the study show. All right. Well, I will, but I mean, how many do you, how many times do you have to tell first people the same message? I don't know. Oh. I got to find better ways. Better ways to teach, more focus on the planet because people are going to be interested in the planet and the impact they can make with their diet. We have a website. I hope you've been there. It's uh, called uh, McDougallFoundation.org, org, not com, dot org. 
at googlefoundation.org. And it tells you about how you can reduce your carbon footprint more than anything else, more than recycling, more than uh, Tesla cars, more than anything else. But change your diet. We did a whole website on that, Mary and I and Heather. It's the team. <laughs> what are you going to run the next program, Heather? We've been busy. Uh, let's see, our next program is October 13th. Oh, not too long. Full. But we are, we do but have you, a But you're full, you're full, but you're going <laughs> to see a couple of people. And I know you are, Heather. So, maybe. And I have Chef AJ's show to do October 2nd. So, you know, they're, they're going to get a few calls from that. Good. So, maybe, maybe. So, our next just... course, our next course is in, isn't until January. However, if you do sign up for the January course, you can have your first visit with Dr. Lim, meet with your support specialist, really get started on the program. So you don't really have to wait until January. So yeah. that's an option. It's October oh, okay. doesn't work. Yeah. All right, it's six o'clock. That hour went by yeah. fast. That was fun. Thanks, Mom and Dad, oh, Dr. McDougal and Mary. Thank no, you, Heather. Fun. It was it was always fun. Every, Every Sunday at five o'clock Pacific time, bring your friends. You know, really, it's important. Uh, we want to share the message with other people. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. See you all next Sunday.